Chapter 14 I awoke to pain and a monstrous urge to itch at the wound. Vaguely, I felt myself being moved, then later waking up, feverish and thirsty, in my room. Saul continued to probe at me, taking my temperature and blood pressure. I was delirious and unaware of how much time passed between checkups. I felt around in the dim light to my thigh to find it a hot mass of bandages. Instantly, Saul grabbed my hand before I could prod any further. If I catch you scratching at it, I'll tie your arms to the bed. You'll rip out your sutures, and you don't have any blood to spare. He sat back down in the chair next to the bed, where I noticed a reading light and a book propped up. The little light in the room was more than my sensitive eyes could handle just then. I tugged at the sweat-soaked sheets and tried to get comfortable, yet despite my best efforts, the pounding headache that accompanied the fever made that impossible. I managed to doze regardless, waking in a dark room to angry voices just outside my door. I couldn't make out what Saul and Lily were arguing about, but it was clear Lily wasn't happy that I had left without her. There would be no peace for me from this point on. It would be a long road before she would trust me again. I wiggled my toes, making sure they were still attached, and put my mind at ease. Stubbornly, I tried to sit up, this time managing to prop myself up slightly on a pillow. Although I was pleased with the tiny victory, I still knew I was too weak to attempt leaving the bed. To my surprise, my bloodied, torn pants had been replaced with clean, loose shorts. My shirt was clean and white, with a smell that hinted at the fact that it had been recently laundered. I lifted up the bottom of the shorts to inspect Saul's work and found my leg clean and wrapped in bandages. I wondered who was tasked with changing me while I was an unconscious, drooling mess. I pushed the uncomfortable thought from my head as I pulled the blankets up. I was still feverish and chilled. We can't leave. No matter what, we'll make do. The last thing I want is to lead anyone back to the house and welcome sickness or the lawless I met back in town. Time will tell what damage I've already done. I was shocked at how desperate my own voice sounded. Saul continued to fumble around in the dark before placing a fresh garbage can in case I got sick again next to my bed. The man I shot was the one watching us. I don't know if he survived or if he'll be paying us a visit sometime in the future, possibly with greater numbers. All that's left for us is to try to survive on what we have for as long as we can. The memory of my encounter tumbled through my mind. At that, I felt small hands placing a cool cloth on my head. Lily, I said at the realization it was her and not Saul shifting around. I tried miserably to sit up, but only succeeded in making myself dizzy before I fell back to bed. When I woke again, I felt around my nightstand until finding the switch for the reading light. A bowl of broth sat next to the bed with a glass of orange juice. Despite my better judgment, I attacked it with a ferocious appetite, hardly tasting the chunks of liver hidden at the bottom of the bowl. The nausea hit me shortly after I drank the last of the juice. I reached for the garbage can. I'm afraid my medical supplies are a bit sparse at the moment. Had to get creative when piecing you back together. Ended up using cat gut and needle to sew your wounds. Really? I shrieked with disgust. My head still hung off the side of the bed. The nausea had lessened, and a fresh bowl of soup was at my bedside. No, not really. I just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. But since you're up, why don't you tell me what you were doing in town, and how you managed to get shot? I cringed at the memory. It seemed like a good idea at the time. I took my time with the next bowl of soup, pausing between bites before continuing. Saul sat patiently as I unraveled the events of my trip to town, leaving out nothing. It's a total ruin. No one there. At least, no one we want to familiarize ourselves with, he corrected. Why do you think I told you to stay away? I hesitated before answering, noting his calmness and lack of surprise at the state of things. You already knew what I would find? Yes. Well, 
Not exactly, but I had a pretty good idea. After you got here, I checked on Harlan. When I couldn't get a hold of him on the radio, I got worried. And? I prodded. Where was I? Why didn't you say anything? Why couldn't you just listen to me? He said, brushing aside my questions. I didn't find anything good. I don't think he was sick. He would have told me, but he had a red flag on his mailbox anyway. Maybe it was to scare others away, but that didn't stop people from raiding his farm. I was trying to avoid the same thing from happening here. As for going to the city, it's not hard to imagine what things are like there. How's Lily? I asked, still groggy. Ah. He was seemingly unsure how to continue. Well, she's pissed. I guessed as much. I'd steer clear of her for a day or so, let her calm down. That shouldn't be difficult. I recalled the effort it took just to sit up. Saul stood and collected the empty bowl before leaving. In the meantime, rest. I'll check on you again in a few hours. Any chance you could bring something other than liver soup? I asked hopefully. No, Saul answered bluntly. The iron in the liver and sugar in the orange juice will help get your blood count up. Plus, we have a good supply of it since no one here likes the taste of it. When you're strong enough to walk up to the kitchen, you can let Lily know you're not a fan of her cooking. Though at this point, I would advise against it. I had no idea what time of day it was or how long I was out, but I laid there feeling weak, but also eager to leave the bed. Peering across the room, I could read the clock's faint numbers. 5.30. I had no idea if it was afternoon or morning. All previous attempts to leave my bed by myself had been worthless. Tasks as simple as going to the bathroom meant relying heavily on Saul for assistance. I hardly had the strength to lift myself up, let alone leave my room. I fumbled next to my bed, found the lamp, and flipped it on. The little light it offered was enough to make me squint. Looking around the room, I immediately noticed it was not as I had left it. My clothes were folded and put away, as were all my other belongings. I wasn't a dirty person, but I never was very good at picking up after myself. Occasionally, I woke slightly to the sounds of Bruno pawing at my door to get in. He didn't have a whole lot going on between his ears, but he was very persistent, eager to check on me. I finally decided it was time to venture out of my bed. When I reached over and turned on my light, I immediately had a flash of deja vu. My empty soup bowl was somehow refilled, this time with piping hot contents. My appetite had returned, and I promised myself the soup as a reward for returning from the bathroom. I pulled myself to the edge of the bed and reluctantly stood. My joints creaked and popped as I took slow, uneasy steps across the room to the door. Putting weight on my bad leg was unbearable. Every step sent a blast of pain through the rest of my body. Saul had the forethought to place a cane next to the bed. Where he got it was a mystery to me. When I finally reached my door and turned the knob, I heard the excitement in Bruno's whines. He tried to bolt in the room to no doubt eat my soup for me while I wasn't looking, but I blocked him and pulled the door tight as I walked out. The hall was quiet and without any signs of life, lit only by the dim lights that lined the edges of the walls. I scanned the area as I walked to the bathroom. On the other side of the room, Saul's door was closed. Most likely, he was sleeping. It also meant that Lily was the one who put the soup next to my bed, and that she was taking my shifts on watch while I recovered. Despite my desire to walk around and loosen up my joints, beyond using the bathroom, I had little strength for much else. Upon returning to my bed, I attacked the bowl of soup in a desperate need to replenish my strength. Bruno jumped in the bed next to me, excited to see me as if I had been gone for a while. Although my expeditions around the basement were getting longer and more frequent, the short walk to the bathroom had drained me, as if I had just spent a long day at work. As soon as my head hit the pillow, I felt myself drift off into sleep once again. In a daze, I felt my mattress shift as someone sat down next to me in the darkness, and a cool, small hand was placed on my forehead. Looks like you will be okay after all, I heard a soft voice say. It was barely a whisper. 
You broke my heart. Why did you break your promise? We were supposed to leave together. I reached for the voice desperately. More than anything, I wanted to convince Lily not to leave the safety of the house, despite the fact that I didn't listen to my own advice. But when I managed to open my eyes and focus, I saw nothing. When I finally woke myself up, no one was around, not even Bruno. I wondered if I had been dreaming again, or if Lily actually did come to check on me. Feeling rested and determined, I pulled the covers off me and exited my room, taking short, uneasy steps. I felt like I had slept so long my joints were starting to seize, and my blood was beginning to settle. It was no wonder people who were bedridden got bed sores. Having lost all sense of time, or even what day it was, I felt like someone who had just woken up from a coma. Faintly in the distance, I could hear Bruno barking frantically. His nails scratched on the floor and echoed down the stairs, disturbing the silence. Glancing out the window in the basement, I could see it was still dark out. I had no idea if it was early in the morning or late at night. Once I reached the top of the stairs, I was greeted by a frantic Bruno twisting and jumping as he looked out the window. I opened the door to the courtyard and let him out to do his business. The second he disappeared into the darkness, the room was restored to its former calm. The more I moved around, the better I started to feel. Lily? I yelled up the stairs with the little strength I could muster. When I got no reply, I decided to climb all the way to the top floor, which I thought would be the most likely place she would be. Walking up the stairs seemed daunting this time. My heavy footsteps echoed off the walls, as well as the sound of my labored breaths. The exercise was bittersweet. It drained my energy, but at the same time loosened up my body. I took short breaks at each landing and continued up the next flight, relief setting over me as I reached the top and could see the glass door to the roof just ahead. Upon opening the door, I was greeted with crisp, cold morning air that immediately filled the stairwell. The sun was a sliver in the distance, just peeking over the tree line in the east. The stone all around me was wet with fresh rain. I reached the edge and peered over into a sea of gray fog, that hung in the air and made it impossible to see the ground. The tower poked up out of the fog, as did choice trees, like I was looking down on clouds. Bruno continued to bark in the courtyard, though he sounded distant and muffled. He was clearly not happy at discovering the gates locked and blocking him from exiting. What he was after was a mystery to me, as was the absence of Lily. I turned and headed back to her door, and gave it a rap that would wake the dead. Still no answer, not even a sound of her turning in her bed. I twisted the knob and pushed the door open. The room was as she found it, bed made, and everything in its proper place. Lily? I yelled, not really expecting to hear a response. I took the stairs a little faster down and looked in the other bedrooms. They were empty as well. Once on the main floor, I checked the library as well as the kitchen. Nothing. Lily! I shouted again down the stairs, but there was no reply. Gripping the railing, leaning on it heavily as I circled the wall, in the courtyard, Bruno matched my painfully slow progress, trotting ahead a few feet and occasionally propping his front paws on the side of the walkway to see over it. As I completed a lap around the top of the wall, I approached the house and saw a figure standing and looking out at the green tips of the maze that reached out of the fog. She's gone, Saul said as I got closer to him. He didn't even bother to look at me as he said the words. I think he only half believed them himself. What do you mean? I asked, puzzled. Gone where? I mean not here. He folded up a note and put it in his pocket. She left. She's on her way back to the city. Why? I asked. She was less than thrilled when she found out you went to town. He answered as he sat on the edge of the wall. That you went without her and got yourself shot. Why didn't you stop her? I barked at him. It's not like I had a choice. I didn't want her to leave, he said, ignoring my tone. And so you let her go? 
What were you thinking? I felt a sense of loss at the thought of her being gone. She left on her own, Vince. I can't force her to do anything, Saul said calmly. She wasn't going to stay here forever. He must have known there would be a time when she would want to leave. She had a life before all this, friends, people she knew. You and I didn't want her to go and would do anything to talk her out of it. But when you went to town to satisfy your own curiosity, she felt betrayed. I told her there was nothing out there for us, but she needed to see it for herself. She waited around until she knew you'd be okay, then left before you could stop her. Of course I would have tried to stop her. There's nothing out there. You make it sound like this house is a prison, I said, feeling mixed emotions. With her gone, I had trouble focusing. My mind raced as I worried. I was lucky to make it back to the house just barely in one piece. What chance would she have on her own? At the same time, I couldn't handle the thought of staying here without her. It is a prison, Saul said with a piercing look. This place is the only thing keeping us safe. How is it a prison? I asked. A long time ago, long before you and I were around, they had cities where fugitives could live. Someone guilty of manslaughter could take refuge in these cities, but only if they learned to trade and earn their keep. Outside of the city, however, was a different story. It was legal for a relative to avenge whoever died. So it was in the best interest of the fugitive to remain in the city where they would be safe with no walls, no guards. He shifted on the wall to face away from the house. Here we are, reasonably safe. But this place has its own price. We have to grow our own food and keep a lookout so no one sneaks up on us. Your trip to town proves we need to watch for people who want to do us harm. Leaving this place has its own share of consequences. But whether you call it a house or a city of refuge, it's still just a fancy way of saying prison. The fear of what is out there is what keeps us here. At some point, we will need to face the reality of our situation. Lily just got sick of waiting. You going sightseeing without her really got her motivated to leave, not to mention she needed to get going if she was to take advantage of the warm weather. If she stayed much longer, she could be trapped here when winter comes. Then she'd starve with you and me. You know, she left you a map. He held up the ratty bits of paper we had looked at together over and over to plan our first trip away once things settled down. Starve? Says who? Me. Our food supplies are getting low, and I don't trust your hunting abilities. While you and I are eating the last of our dried venison, she'll be turning brown on some beach in the Caribbean and eating red snapper and coconuts. No, not brown, red. She's very fair-skinned, I retorted. What do you think the chances are we'd make it? I think you're asking the wrong question. Would you rather try and catch up with her or tough it out here for another winter? Good point. I rolled the options around in my head. Before the outbreak, I'd have jumped at the chance at a change of scenery. Now I'd become so concerned with my next meal and simply surviving that it had left room in my life for little else. There are two ways of looking at what you found back in town, Saul said as he passed me Lily's note and map. We can choose to hunker down in fear, struggle through another winter, and assume everyone we meet will be like the man you met. Or... We can focus on the fact that fewer people means less chance of contagion. At the very least, we now know from what your friend said the travel restrictions have been lifted. My leg throbbed in pain at the near mention of a trip back to town. I leaned heavily on the stone railing as I looked over Lily's note. Should you choose to follow, was all it said, before a detailed itinerary the first stop being the city, followed by marked marinas and ports down the coast on her way to warmer weather. We can be sure she'll stop at the city, but beyond that, her course may vary depending on what she finds or wind conditions or weather. The longer we wait, the likelihood of finding her deteriorates. I sighed heavily, partly from exertion and partly from the thought of losing Lily. This whole thing is my fault. It is. Saul agreed coldly. Her leaving, I mean, not the rest of our situation. 
That's giving you way too much credit. But getting shot and chasing her away, that's all on you. We were going to leave together, check things out when the time was right. I imagine this is how she felt when she found out that I had left, abandoned or betrayed even. What made you change your mind to leave? I asked. I didn't. So why are you trying to talk me into following? I'm not. Sounds like you are. Saul sighed. I'm merely presenting our current circumstances in a way so you can make an educated decision. I still think leaving the safety of the house is a bad idea. I'm still not afraid of the possibility of getting visitors. I still think it's too soon to leave. But if that's what you heard, it sounds to me like your mind is already made up. When did she leave? I asked, still in disbelief. Most likely in the middle of the night, while we were asleep. I was reminded by the crisp morning breeze that every moment wasted in indecision carried her farther away. So at best, she has an eight-hour start. I turned and walked to the door with Bruno in tow. You coming? Saul stood conflicted as he looked out over his property, which he had rarely strayed from. Did you ever check on that boat of yours? Do you think it's even still there? He asked. No, I decided to go to town and got shot instead, I answered sarcastically. Saul's icy glare made me instantly regret my comment. The winter was very mild, I said in answer to his question. As long as the water didn't freeze around it or the anchors let loose, and no one took it, it should still be there waiting for us. I limped into the house, each step tugging at my stitches, and clung to the furniture as I made my way to the stairs, then paused, unsure if I'd have the strength to make the trip. Shaking off the thought, I focused on smaller goals, like making it to the truck. That sounds like a lot of ifs, Saul called. You don't think she would have taken it? No, she liked her little boat, easier to handle. Again, unless the hull is cracked, if that's the case, we won't be able to follow her. I tried to focus on the possibility of finding a place untouched, and not the crushing evidence to the contrary, a feat made harder by the constant throbbing of my leg. When I was on my way up here, my town was in rough shape, but there were still pockets of areas that were doing okay. There were a lot of streets and houses that seemed normal, I pointed out. Even if your hometowns are in rough shape, don't forget we're in a deeply quarantined area. That doesn't mean that farther down the coast things aren't better, Saul pointed out ever the optimistic type. With Bruno darting ahead excitedly in anticipation, I headed to my room and started packing my bag with extra clothes and supplies before slowly climbing the stairs up to the truck. I was leaving the rest of the packing to Saul. I took my time, my heart beating heavily as I climbed. In the time it took me to limp to the truck, Saul had managed to load up our remaining canned goods. I was stunned when he said it was all we had left. I could still recall the packed storage rooms on the day I arrived. You still need to be very careful, Saul said. He tossed his duffel bag into the back of the truck as I leaned against the side, dragging air into my lungs. It'll probably take a few weeks before your strength returns. Not to mention your leg needs time to heal. I'm still not sure how much blood you lost. How long was I out? I asked. Four days. He paused. You were touch and go at first. I'm not sure you should even be walking around, to be honest. Four days? It had felt like one, two tops. I'll be fine, I said sharply. I got in the passenger seat and slammed the door. As Saul continued to pack, I wondered what good I'd be on the boat if it took that much effort just to climb the stairs. I could see Saul shaking his head as he loaded the rest of our supplies in the back. Even Bruno had a backpack to add to the pile of gear in the back of the old truck. He eagerly jumped up in the truck and picked out a spot right in the middle of the bench seat with his large spoon tongue hanging out and flopping back and forth as he looked around excitedly. I paused when I realized that it had been a long time since he was in a car. Saul did a quick lap around the house, locking up any gates and doors. If anyone wanted to get in, they would have to work for it like I did. Once he finished buttoning up the house, Saul joined me in the cab of the truck. 
He paused for a second before opening the garage door and starting up the truck. It fired up and the dashboard came to life and lit up our fuel gauge, which revealed we had a quarter tank of gas. I'm not going to be able to drive much farther than the beach. Hopefully your boat is still there. Saul didn't look in his rearview mirror as we pulled down the driveway and around its many turns. He didn't even bother to move the brush in front of the driveway entrance at the end. Instead, he just floored the truck and ran it all over, sending branches and dried leaves in every direction. That's one of the benefits to old trucks versus new ones, he said with a smile on his face. It's got so many scratches and dents that you don't really worry about adding a few more. As we pulled out and turned left in the direction of the coast, I could see the truck I had used to get back from town. It was dead on the side of the road in the opposite direction. Saul didn't bother to observe the rules of the road as he ran stop signs and traveled at almost double the posted speed. He only stopped or slowed down for turns in the road and fallen branches. Freebird the hound dog. You out there, hound dog? Saul said, laughing into the CB. When I was a kid, we had so much fun with these things talking to truckers on long road trips. He flipped through the channels on the receiver, then switched his attention to the truck's radio, but found only static. Well, that's not looking so good for us. This might just end up being a quick trip to the city, only to find ourselves back at my place. Maybe, I said gloomily, sinking into the seat as I already fought sleep. But who knows, we might be pleasantly surprised. They might throw us a parade and welcome us back like a couple of heroes. Possibly. Or throw you in jail for stealing a boat. Saul downshifted as we rounded a sharp turn down a little-known path to the beach. We arrived in what I would imagine was record time and got out of the truck and slowly walked down the path that would take us to where the boats were anchored. I was slightly nervous at the prospect of finding the bay empty, but as it turned out, we broke out of the tree line to the beach and saw big divots in the sand where I assumed Lily's boat was kept, as well as her tracks around it. Off in the distance, quite farther than I remembered leaving it, my boat still hung on and bobbed back and forth in the waves. It somehow lacked the luster and shine that it had the first time I had seen it, perhaps from spending a winter exposed to the elements. The front of the boat was covered with evidence that suggested it was a popular hangout for seagulls. She doesn't look like much, Saul said as he looked it over. Don't worry, it will clean up nice. If I remember right, there should be stuff on board that will shine it right up. I'm just glad it still floats. I dug in the weeds to see if the dinghy was still there. To my surprise, it was where I had left it, and it had some air in it. Saul took a seat in the sand and puffed it back up until it was firm. Once he was done, he wasted no time in bringing all our gear to the beach as I rested up against the boat with Bruno at my side. When all the gear was down, we dragged it over the water and got in. I managed to nod off slightly next to the warmth of Bruno as Saul rowed us over to the boat. When we got closer, I woke up, and I was able to see just how dirty it had gotten. Saul tied up the dinghy and began to unload our goods. Fortunately, most of the seagulls stayed on the front of the boat and left the back considerably cleaner. Don't push yourself. I'll get the gear. You get some rest, Saul called as he headed back for the remainder of our stuff. I struggled onto the boat, already feeling spent. My strength still hadn't returned. A flood of memories rushed back to me from my trip up, the uncertainty mixed with excitement I felt during my journey driving me to my goal. I traced the edge of the wheel as I reacquainted myself with the boat, hoping we'd be able to coax enough speed out of it to close the distance between Lily and us. I sat in the cockpit of the boat and watched as Saul brought the rest of the gear on board. After two more trips, he announced we were ready to leave. The wind must have kicked this boat around over the past few months, I said, pointing to where I remembered leaving it. Originally, I was farther up the beach. I cracked open the hatch, struggled down the stairs, and scanned the inside. It was intact, aside from miscellaneous items that were rolling around on the floor, most likely knocked loose from the shelves during some storm. A book lying on the floor of the boat caught my eye. It was the owner's journal. I returned it to the shelf with the rest of the small library that was in disarray. You can clean and organize everything later. We don't need to put it all away now. 
Saul said, pulling off the covers to the mainsail. Get the anchor. I tried to avoid falling in the water as I limped to the front of the boat by grabbing ropes and cables all the way. When I pulled on the rope that disappeared into the murky water, it didn't budge. It must be stuck on something, I called to Saul as he walked up to give me a hand. When I left it here, I tied three of them on one line so it would have some extra weight. We both got a good grip on the rope and pulled. One by one, we felt them give way. They were covered in slime and other evidence that they had spent months at the bottom. Once they had a good rinsing, the main one was returned to the anchor depot at the front, and the others were stowed away under the seats at the back. Almost immediately, the boat started to drift with the wind and take on a life of its own now that it was free. Saul raised the main sail, and the boat caught the wind and pulled it farther over. Saul, now at the back, swung the boat around to a southeast heading, as much into the wind as it would allow. We will have to zigzag down like this unless the wind changes. Hopefully that's the case. If it is, then we will make up some time and not have to go so much out of our way. He pulled out the Genoa, which caused the boat to lean even more. If Lily is headed for the city, she will most likely stay as close to shore as she can. We should be able to see him if we do the same. Feeling exhausted, I sat down and watched the land slowly drift out of sight. Do you think we'll be able to catch her before she gets to the city? I was worried if we didn't catch up with her by then, it may be a bit harder to find her. That little boat she's on probably isn't as fast as this one, and she won't be able to handle strong winds. If that's the case, she will either lower her sails and take a break or dump most of her wind and she will probably stop at night. She's not trying to catch anyone now. He pulled a sweater out of his pack and pulled it over his head. Why don't you go get some rest? You shouldn't be pushing yourself any more than you have to just yet. I didn't argue. I slowly climbed down into the galley of the boat and started separating our gear, putting my bags in the forward cabin and loading our food in the cabinets. I glanced around at the small space that would be our home for the foreseeable future. Tiny as it was compared to Saul's estate, it was somehow intimidating with the endless horizon just outside it. My trip to town had deadened all curiosity as to the state of things outside the grounds. I struggled to imagine a scenario back in the city that would satisfy Lily. My leg ached as I imagined the people we may or may not bump into. Based on how things were when I passed through so many months ago, I almost felt we should bypass it altogether toward warmer weather. I took the time below to sort out and secure our supplies to prevent them from rolling around the cabin while the hull undoubtedly rolled in the waves. Saul had taken the time to pack my rifle as well. I picked it up and flipped it over as I noticed for the first time how worn it had gotten from so much use over the past months. I lost track of it after my trip to town and hadn't given it a second thought since. I pushed aside the cushions on one of the benches and lifted up the lid under them to expose the storage compartment. Without a second thought, I placed the rifle in it, silently hoping I'd never need it again. When I was finished, I struggled to balance myself as I stumbled to bed, fighting the shifting floor. The boat rolled lazily in the waves, making it difficult to get comfortable. Sleeping on a boat while it was being sailed wasn't the easiest thing to do, but I welcomed the challenge. I kicked off my boots and climbed into the white sheets that were just as I had left them. While shifting pillows and blankets back and forth, I tried to find the sweet spot in the bed where I didn't roll with the boat and my leg didn't hurt. With as much as the boat was leaning, more of me was on the wall than on the actual bed. I tried to focus on the waves rocking the boat, letting it lull me to sleep. Any little bit helped keep my mind off the throbbing pain in my leg. But even as bad as it felt, it was a big improvement from the first night when Saul stitched it up and drowned it with whiskey. Every time I started to feel myself relax, a large wave smashed up against the side of the boat and pushed it over even more. I buried my head in my pillow in a miserable attempt to deaden the sound of the water rushing along the hull as it parted the waves. The hiss was louder than I remembered, but then again the last time I slept on the boat it was at anchor. Bruno joined me in the small cabin, 
letting out a snort of approval after burrowing in. I did my best to do the same, to let go and not worry about the uncertainty that lay ahead. We'd made the best decision we could. It was pointless to waste precious energy dwelling on things beyond our control. The little light that was let in by the small hatch in the ceiling was enough to make me already miss my little room back at Saul's house. But eventually, the events of the day took their toll. Soon, my body's demand for sleep was enough to reduce the uncomfortable conditions to a minor irritation. Before long, I felt myself drifting off into a fitful sleep. <laughs>